A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, myself, Dr. Benita Pathak from the Brugger University, as ma'am said. And at the outset, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, convey my sincere gratitude to all the panelists of the Indian Academy of Sciences who have provided me the opportunity to become a, a associate of the Academy and uh, again giving me this chance to present my work. The atmospheric uh, chemistry where we talk about the composition of the atmosphere is an important component of the climate change. But the climate itself is a very complex system where its subsystems are in complex interaction with each other. However, the human-induced climate change, which is which is well known right now, is because of the alteration of the climate uh, uh, composition of the Earth atmosphere, not because of the natural causes like fluctuation of the solar output, etc. And uh, IPCC has identified aerosols greenhouse gases and land use changes as the major contributor along with the ozone and the clouds present in the earth atmosphere. So most of us are aware of the natural greenhouse effect on, um, without which our life would not have been possible in our art. But what worries us is the human enhanced greenhouse effect where the concentration of the greenhouse gas level has uh, attained to an unprecedented um, by an unprecedented uh, manner and has reached to such a uh, state that our now global warming is uh, it has become a, a global climate emergency situation but unlike the greenhouse gases the aerosol which have a potential to interact with the solar radiation, where scattering type of aerosols uh, such as sulfate, nitrates, organics, these can scatter back the solar radiation to the space. And also some absorbing aerosols like black carbon, brown carbon dust, etc., they can absorb the solar radiation. Both these processes actually they reduce the amount of energy uh, at the surface, thus, thus reducing the temperature of the earth's surface. And this is called direct effect due to the aerosols. And this effect actually can mask about 30% of global uh, greenhouse gas warming, as according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report in 2013. And one important uh, point I should uh, mention here is without the presence of aerosols, clouds cannot be formed. And again, clouds take part in the uh, interaction of, um, it interacts with the solar radiation, it reduces um, or it absorbs uh, solar and terrestrial radiation and weather phenomena as we know, but in a very uncertain manner. And looking at the sources, uh, not only the aerosols actually, the greenhouse gases also uh, are emitted. We can think that the uh, emissions can contribute to a local area or to a particular region, but the fact is not like that. Once these are emitted into the atmosphere, the problem can become global. For example, the plume of aerosols and gases generated in East and Southeast Asian countries can have a transatlantic movement to reach the Northern American continent, as was shown by Lawrence and Lillivan through their uh, modeling simulation. And the desert dust from China region can have a trans-Pacific uh, movement to reach the southern part of the um, American continent and then can reach to the Atlantic again. So the problem becomes global. That's why we are so much worried about the uh, 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 aerosols, but then coming to the global situation, our group has uh, recently shown how the aerosol burden, uh, the increment from 2003 to 2017, the increment is quite appreciable over the South East Asia, uh, South Asian region encompassing the uh, Indian subcontinent, contributed by the uh, anthropogenic uh, or fine mode aerosol particles uh, designated by a parameter called a strong exponent. Some signature of uh, increment of sulfur dioxide was also reported. Eastern Himalayan foothill regions, as you all know, this region is highly vegetated and does become uh, I mean, uh, a source of primary biological aerosols as background aerosols. So those primary biological aerosols can be pollen, fungal spore, animal or plant debris, microbes also, which can efficiently take part in the ice nucleation. And the microbes over this region have been identified from the species to phylum level in a recent work by us. 
in a campaign mode study, we have covered uh, the uh, Brahmaputra Valley, actually. Apart from this background natural source, the region is also rich in anthropogenic sources. For example, the bricklands are there, the black box are identifying those, oil and natural gas fields are there. So many industries on based on oil and gases are uh, in and around the, uh, I mean, the location where I am sitting right now. And then again, uh, the coal, open coal mines are also present. All these together with the fire activities, which are anthropogenic in nature, not natural. Yeah, which, uh, and these fires are actually uh, associated with the shifting cultivation in the primarily in the hilly region. This peaks in the month of March and April um, uh, annually. And to quantify how much of uh, the this biomass burning we call this biomass burning contribute to the uh, carbon monoxide, which, which is an atmospheric pressure with lifetime one to three months, uh, can contribute to the uh, Measurement location, Diprugar, where we have some measurements of carbon monoxide, um, methane, etc. And we could found that day, on day to day basis, up to 90% of carbon monoxide can be contributed by this um, biomass body. And thus, the Diprugar, the location Diprugar is uh, attributed, um, I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, it um, experiences 50. 9% of contribution of carbon monoxide from the northeastern region itself, followed by the Chinese region and indo gangetic plain. And the biomass burning uh, fraction could also be um, uh, actually calculated from the measured black carbon concentration at three, four different locations of uh, where, uh, uh, four different locations, Agartala, Shillong, Dibrugar, and Imphal, where ISRO has their observatory for aerosol measurements. All these species actually uh, emitted not only the carbon monoxide, only methane and uh, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, as I have mentioned um, from the so all the sources can emit these things, and these can take part in the formation of ozone in the atmosphere. And these form a complex um, and uh, rich. Uh, atmospheric chemistry, I should say, has made the northeastern region to actually uh, to be in a um, to be in the highest position over the South Asian region. Um, uh, the uh, above mentioned sources are taking part in the atmospheric chemistry of ozone, and that has made the northeastern part of the region, uh, northeastern part, to uh, maximize in ozone total ozone concentration, where the ozone concentration is uh, for, from both the troposphere and the stratosphere. And for the measurement of ozone at the surface. Uh, which we do from the from Dibrugar, we see a uh, daytime increment because of the presence of uh, the sunlight during the daytime and nighttime minimum. But you can see during the monsoon season, this day and night uh, uh, difference is quite uh, lower. It is the region behind this is actually uh, the lightning which is an extreme weather event and which is contributing to the formation of uh, ozone uh, in the nighttime. And there is a there was a publication in 2015 where we have shown that 33 percent of measured uh, ozone at the surface was because of the lightning process. During the lightning, actually, uh, the above mentioned uh, uh, chemical path and also through these two paths, uh, we get actually maximum um, more amount of NOx, NO and NO2. And somehow at the point when uh, NOx, total NOx increases, there is a, uh, uh, I mean, a titration of ozone takes place and we get simultaneous peak of NOx, but deep in ozone. But after that, when this titration changes, then we get increment of ozone. And this happened for uh, three years observation. And our modeling studies, which I am not showing right now, is also uh, giving a similar result. During a lightning event accompanied by thunderstorms, yes. actually, yeah, uh, the biomass burning generated or from other sources uh, which generate carbon monoxide and um, hydrogen, uh, I mean, OH radicals that can be uplifted into some higher uh, levels and uh, the ozone also can produce at some elevated levels. These are uh, what we are interested in today. 
one more part is during another uh, extreme uh, weather events uh, during cyclone uh, ozone also can get transported from the stratosphere towards the troposphere so these two parts are contributing to the higher level of ozone present in the northeastern part of india apart from that methane uh, which is an important greenhouse gas it is also increasing at a faster rate in the eastern himalayan region compared to the global one and it is mainly because of the wetland increase of wetland in the uh, bangladesh region and also anthropogenic activities are of course there and uh, the eastern himalayan uh, methane has uh, it, it is projected to increase by twofold by 2050 and by threefold by 2100 uh, from its baseline year 2000 and the methane radiative forcing in induced temperature change over the eastern himalayan region per decade increase is quite uh, stronger compared to the global now apart from those local sources there is for this region the indo gangetic plain is also uh, serving as a remote location through where uh, through the western corridor we can say the indo gangetic haze can reach towards dibrugar dibrugar is somewhere here and this is also actually evident from the high speed back trajectory analysis the western uh, influences to this particular region and we, our regional climate model simulation have shown how 10 to 20 percent of aerosol optical depth is being contributed over this region is being contributed by the indo gangetic plane and which actually uh, translates into 12 to 30 percent of atmospheric um, uh, forcing over this region and with all those sources actually the northeastern part or the, this eastern himalayan region uh, it, uh, the aerosol optical depth which uh, gives the aerosol burden it maximizes in the pre-monsoon season followed by the winter and we see a east west asymmetry at 93 93 degree east you can say and that is evident also from the arfin the isro ISRO's uh, network measurements and also from the regional climate model simulation. And in our land campaign also, we have identified two hotspots in the two regions. One is Western and Eastern part, we can say. And we have also reported that this uh, aerosol optical depth again is uh, it ranks second highest in the South, uh, South Asia next to ICP, Indo-Gangetic Plain. And that trans again, uh, that aerosol optical depth, which translates into the heating of the atmosphere in terms of, um, I mean, radiative forcing and then heating rate. Also, we show we see uh, east-west asymmetry. The western uh, parts, Silong and Agartala, uh, having a high, I mean, atmospheric forcing compared to the Impal and Dibruger, which uh, falls on, uh, in the eastern part. And most of the, I mean, seventy percent of forcing uh, in Dibruger. Uh, actually is uh, assigned to the black carbon only which uh, is uh, and which gives 75% um, of heating in the atmosphere and during lockdown process uh, we could see how the anthropogenic perturbation is contributing to the uh, particulate matter which is for solid phase of, phase of uh, aerosols actually uh, how the during the lockdown uh, period these aero perturbations are not there for the aerosol particles and also for the gases but uh, ozone yeah it's because of its chemistry it it always uh, rises and that had the during the lockdown period uh, we could see the moderately polluted level has uh, come down to the satisfactory level of air quality over the region and these patches here for the sulfur dioxide these are because still present during the lockdown period it is because of the presence of uh, coal uh, based power plants in this region which uh, are uh, contributing to the sulfur dioxide level and we should mention that the sulfur dioxide can get converted into sulfur aerosols with an efficiency of 30 percent in the monsoon and 15 uh, i mean lowest in winter with 15 percent for the indian region that has been uh, published recently and the aerosol optical depth as there is a global increment the northeastern uh, 
region also is showing increment in the aerosol optical depth, uh, thereby contributing to the increase in uh, cloud condensation nuclei and decrease uh, or overall decrease in the cloud effective radius, showing uh, aerosol cloud interaction and where actually uh, the decrement in rainfall was also reported. And that is to asymmetry that I have mentioned is also visible for the long term 40 years of uh, I mean, rainfall pattern. And the most important observation I wish to mention here is the winter time decrease in the rainfall uh, during December, January and February, which is quite important for this eastern part of the region where most of the tea gardens are present. So tea gardens uh, and uh, the, the tea industry is suffering from actually uh, this uh, lower amount of rainfall. Uh, and the, during this uh, year uh, also, they had to wait till May to pluck, start plucking of the teas. And uh, for last 10 years, March April production of tea has come down by three times as reported. So uh, that has actually uh, led to the irrigation cost over this region because nowadays most of the tea gardens has to have to uh, rely on the irrigation for the tea production, which is again uh, can create a treat for the drinking water over this region. And these are the contributors, my uh, research group. And uh, thank you for uh, listening and uh, the acknowledgements are here. Thank you very much. I was Mrs. wondering, Sorry. what is the, no, no, what's the uh, contribution of water vapor to all of this? Because water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, right? Uh, so yes. Does water vapor, because you talked about uh, Bangladesh and the wetlands contributing to methane, but I was just wondering about water vapor. Could you tell me, tell us something about that? Yes, yes. Water vapor uh, is, uh, of course, uh, it is from evapotranspiration process because the, the, the huge vegetation cover, evapotranspiration is there, and that the Bangladesh region very close to the Bay of Bengal is there. So that water vapor is uh, really, it is the, uh, taking part in the uh, atmospheric chemistry because there is a one cycle. I have not go, gone into detail about the water vapor contribution in the formation of ozone. And mostly water vapor, even though it, it is a great now uh, gas it is considered but it's a uh, it is uh, by a response water vapor response we usually call because its um, contribution is again it comes to the uh, i mean formation of clouds and all also it uh, contributes but in atmospheric chemistry of course i should mention the water vapor plays an important role and if we can actually measure the water vapor then it can, we can directly related related to the rainfall over this region so uh, there is a possibility because we have some uh, GNSS receivers from where water vapor can be calculated. That work has uh, yet to uh, take up actually, and uh, uh, okay. of course, and because ozone production, ozone. Uh, chem uh, so when we talk about atmospheric chemistry, basically uh, it is ozone chemistry, but because aerosols are also comp uh, chemical components, only, I'm also, uh, of course, we can include, um, and water vapor has a significant role not only in the tropospheric chemistry but in the stratospheric chemistry as well uh, but yeah in the stratosphere that water vapor comes from between not from it goes from right uh, to, from the surface That's true. okay okay thank you thank you very much i think there are no further questions for you so thank you for that very interesting talk <laughs>